Welcome back to the Art and Business of Writing podcast, and I am with Elliot Katz today. Elliot, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Yeah, so Elliot, um, tell us a little bit more um, you know, from the bio about yourself. Well, I've written several books. My first books were about the outdoors, and then I decided to write a book about men and relationships, and it was, it was all, like a lot of books of um, this type. It was about my own experience. I was married and divorced, and you know, at first you blame the other person, and then you come to the point of asking yourself, what do I have to learn from all this? And I started by just listening to other men, and the more I listened to other men, the more I realized a lot of men are confused, like I am. <laughs> so I started reading books, and then I, and then I realized, uh, then I really turned to the timeless wisdom that fathers and other older male role models used to teach younger men about being a man in a relationship, and I, I was kind of blown away because it coincided with what I heard women complain is lacking in men today that they don't show leadership, they don't make decisions, they don't take responsibility. So I published the book, and, and then I decided, well, I want to change the world. I want to change the men of the world, and not just the men of the English-speaking world, but I want to change the entire world. So I started looking at uh, selling foreign rights to publishers in different countries, and uh, it, it showed me that what I was experiencing is human nature. Thought a lot of men around the world are experiencing it because it's been translated into 24 languages. And it's been very rewarding to get comments back, like this book saved my marriage. This book, if I would have had this book you know, a year ago, my relationship wouldn't have broken up. And I've got comments from divorced women of my husband of 38 years that understood that these crucial truths, our marriage would not have disintegrated. So it's really making a difference and teaching the stuff to men that, you know, there's so much stuff out there, but no one's really teaching them the, the, the wisdom and insights that fathers used to teach younger men about being a man. Wow. So what are some of, like, unpack your book a little bit for us. What are some of the things that are inside the covers? Well, the most important lesson is really about leadership that a lot of men today think, and I was one of them, well, you know, I, I don't want to be controlling and what do I know about being a husband and father? I'll just ask, you know, I'll work hard, bring in the money, ask, come home, ask my wife what she wants me to do, and I'll just do whatever she wants. I'm a great husband. Well, it, it doesn't really work that way. Then men, men think that they're great, but to a woman, you know, a woman really wants to look up to men. She wants a man who's strong. And when you're always asking a woman what to do, she feels like he's one of the children and he, she's his mother and she can't respect him. So it's not about being controlling because that's what men fear. They fear about being accused of being controlling. The, the women really want men who, who are leaders that are aware of what's going on in their families, aware of what's going on in their marriage. Or if you're just, you know, dating, aware of what's going on in your relationship and says, well, here's a situation, you know, I, I'll deal with it. I'll step forward. I'll find a solution and implement it. And women really like that. And it even begins right on the first date. I couldn't tell you how many single women have told me that they, when they, a guy asks them out on a date to go out for a cup of coffee, he can't even choose a place to go for a cup of coffee. And a lot of women have said to me, when a man does that, it turns them right off because if he can't even choose a place to go for coffee, how is he going to handle real challenges in a marriage and, and family life? So it's not about being controlling. It's just, that, you know, there's a frustration with when a man says, oh, whatever you want, you decide. Women are really frustrated. You think, I'm the nicest guy. I'm letting her decide. Very, very frustrating. They, they really want a man who steps forward, takes charge, shows leadership. Even, you know, she can be very successful in business. She can be, have her own business and be the CEO. When she, I've had women say this to me in those situations. That when I'm with a man, I want to feel like a woman. I want him to take charge. So, and that, these ideas have been totally, like they've almost disappeared today. Like, but because it used to be a father would teach his son. And that's, and so much lost today. And, and yet women really want, the fascinating thing about the book, the response to the book was, women say, yeah, this is what we want. How do I get a man to read this book? How do I get a man to be this way? <laughs> and it's the men who say, no, no, this isn't what women want. It's, 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 you laugh, but it's, it's almost, it's an irony, but you know, they need women to tell them, yes, this is what we want. We don't want a controlling tyrant. We want a man who's a leader, who can, who's our rock that we can lean on, who's, Who's a tower? Excuse me, a tower of strength that we can look up to. You know, these are all old-fashioned things, but really, I've heard it so much from women today. 
this is what they want. You know, when a woman says to me, what does your book say it means to be a man? I said, well, one in one word, it means to be a leader. And they smile. Yeah, that's what they want. Not a controlling tyrant, but someone who just doesn't always say, oh, yes, yes, dear, yes, dear. You know, I've been to too many weddings where the father, the groom gets up and says, here's my advice to you, son. I'm being a good husband. Just say yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. <clears throat> I can tell you the last wedding I went to like that, I went, I'm friends with the father or the bride. You know, and now he's telling me they're having a lot of problems because he's, he's, he followed his advice. Like whenever there's a decision to, made, to be made, he says, oh, whatever you want, you decide. And, and he thinks, I'm the nicest guy. I'm a great husband. Well, she wants a man who steps forward and takes charge. Wow, dude, that's, that's a lot. That, that's, that's true. That is so true, man. I tell you, it's, it's funny because when you, when you uh, talk about having a book that has that sort of message, and then when you look at kind of the, the way that television and pop culture portrays men, it's almost, they, they run like the clash. Oh, I know, I know. And that's one of the big problems that men are portrayed as uh, incapable buffoons on TV. It's horrible. And, and nowadays, you, know, you hear a lot of talk about the masculinity crisis and masculine confusion. And it's all because, well, what do we hear? Men are described, talk, we hear toxic masculinity. We hear... Uh, you know, misogynist, sexist, uh, controlling, aggressive, violent, like as if that is what traditional masculinity is. Well, no, it isn't. It, you know, one thing that I discuss in the book is, you know, what does it mean to be manly? Well, being manly is a noble quality. And I can say that because Webster's Dictionary defines it that way. Manliness is the noble qualities of a man of mature character, courage, independence, integrity, honesty, morality. These are all positive things. These are things that every man should be working on developing in his character. Even the word virtue, well, the original meaning of the word virtue was manly qualities. It's like, it's, just, it's, it's a positive thing. We have to, you know, as men, we have to work on ourselves. It doesn't come natural. We have to work on ourselves to develop our characters to be true, tr truly manly. It's, it's, it's not toxic. It's not, it, it, so that's, I mean, that's really like contributing to all the confusion. You know, when, when, when you hear on the internet, oh, don't tell a, the worst thing you can say to boys, be a man. Well, well, it depends how you define being a man. If you say it's being toxic, yeah, but that's what it means. Being a man means taking responsibility. When the difference between a boy and a man is a man takes responsibility for his actions. Well, that's a positive thing. Of course, we should tell boys to be men because grow up and take responsibility for your actions and take responsibility for those around you. These are all positive things that it means to be a man. If you're going to say, you know, continue your boyhood, I, I don't know, you know, become a, develop your feminine side. Well, be sensitive. Well, yes, be sensitive to other people's feelings, but don't, you know, a, a, a woman doesn't want to be with a man who acts like a woman. She wants to be with a man who acts like a man. So yes, be sensitive to other people's feelings. But if you're, you know, I was once asked on a radio show, is it uh, strong when a man cries? Is a man being strong when he cries? I said, well, you know, if your mother has died and you're at her funeral, yeah, I mean, you, you, you could cry because you lost someone you love. But if you're crying, you're coming home every day to your wife and crying about what happened at work, she's going to be, she's going to be turned off. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, as you were writing the book, you know, what were, what were some of the, some of the challenges that you, that you faced as you were writing the book? Cause I mean, you're writing a book that's, you know, really trying to create like a revival in manhood. What were some of the things that were going through your mind as you were writing the book? Well, you know, a lot of it was, I, I, I thought, am I the only one who needs this? I, that was sort of, so what I started with, like, am I writing a book just for myself? And that's, uh, for a long time, I thought, well, I'm just writing it for myself. Maybe I'll learn it better by writing it down. And, and uh, but what really struck me was when I, a lot of the book is based on sources written like a, a lot of writing by men about to you know targeted young men about being a man. Like over this, so fast. I read something I like, written a thousand years ago, or two thousand years ago, or, or four thousand years ago, and I said, "Wow, that just could be written today." Like that's amazing. I was like, it would just blow me away. And and one of them, and like everyone knows. This, you know, we look at the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and they have, they're commanded not to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And then Eve eats it, and she pressures Adam to eat it. And then Adam is hiding in the bushes as if he's hiding from responsibility. 
And God says to him, Adam, did you eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge that I command you not to eat? And, and what does he do? And I, I mean, you're reading this as if you're looking for advice on, on relationships. <laughs> he says, the woman you sent me gave me, and I ate. I said, I couldn't believe it. He gave into something he knew was wrong, and then he blames his wife. I said, nothing has changed. That's what I did. That's what all the other men I know do. <laughs> so really, it, like, it was so fresh. It was, it was like written like today. It's like, wow. And so you realize a lot of this stuff that men face is nothing new. Like men have faced these challenges of, of you know, being a leader, being strong, dealing with women, you know, having a good, wanting to have a good relationship. But really too often, like just sort of backing down, being, not not being strong, being thinking, well, I'll just give in, and I'll have peace. But I don't realize, well, yeah, sometimes that's good. But some, if you could keep doing that all the time, she'll have no respect for you. Like she'll, you know, if if she, if you just be her doormat, if you're just always giving, giving, giving to her, and you make her into a taker, well, that that's not good, right? That's, you know, so so it's just really what I found was just fascinating. Like over these centuries. The situations that men face today are, are are the same as they faced in the past. You know, just, uh, you know, another one is, is The Taming of the Shrew, right? I mean, it's a very famous book by Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. And, I, and But really, what is what is the test in there? The test is saying, well, you know, is my wife going to listen to what I say? <laughs> I mean, it's not about being controlling. Is this, is she, or is she going to completely ignore me, right? That's like, oh. <laughs> You know, I've heard so many men complain about the same thing today that, you know, they do, they do, they do for their wives. And then, then they ask their wives for something and they, and they just get ignored. Oh, wow. It's like nothing has changed. You know, you can't, you know, you have got to make sure you should do for your wife, but just make sure that she's doing for you as well. It's, it's, you know, you've got to be giving, both people have to give. It's not just giving, 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 and you make the other person to take her. So it's just a lot of things, you know, basically the message is, Human nature hasn't changed. And that really links into this whole idea of selling foreign rights because, you know, here I thought, you know, in other cultures, you know, men are different. You know, like in Japan, every man has a geisha. And in Brazil, like, the you know, men are really macho. <laughs> you know, in those countries, the books were published, translated and published by big publishers, and they sold very well. <laughs> so I think really the message, what I learned and, and really relating to foreign rights is, you know, human nature it's the same wherever you go whatever culture you're in you know people have the same needs to learn to grow the same insecurities and if you're written a book that appeals to that you know if you're you know if if an advice book a book of wisdom of insights then then you have a good chance of selling foreign rights to publishers in other countries yeah, and I want to get to that. I want to ask you one more question before I dive into the foreign rights side. Okay. Is, um, talk about your research. It sounds like your book is very well researched, and it sounds like you had a good time doing it. Like, how did you approach the compiling all the information you needed to, to put together this book? Well, you know, basically, you know, it was like my own journey. I, here I was divorced. I was thinking, well, you know, I don't want to go through this again. I, oh, I, I, I want to have a successful relationship. So, like I said at the beginning, at first I blamed the other person. And I said, what do I have to learn? So the research was really, you know, it started not as a research for a book, but as research for myself. Like, what do I have to learn from this? I don't want, you know, I don't want to go through this again. And so I'd read something and it would give a reference to something else. And it would give a, and then I read some, you know, text written like, you know, 200 years ago. There's a lot of like writings. I, and then I'd, I'd find some other references, something else is really, uh, just sort of one thing led to another and just like sort of stumbling on things and I'd read something in one place and you know even even like looking up the, the word husband and manly in the dictionary you know I, I you know the book the story the, the book is in the form of a story of a grandfather teaching his wisdom to his, his grandson and sort of meant to say well it skipped a generation and that's really what's happened today is that fathers aren't teaching their sons this and at the end, he says, well, I thought I'd make up this word, husbandship. But this is what a man has to show, husbandship. And I thought, well, I should, if I made up a word, I should look in the dictionary to see what it means. If it means, if it already exists, I've made it up. It already existed. And it already meant exactly what I thought it meant. So we think husband means just being a spouse, a male spouse. But husband actually means someone who manages his home. That's what it means. That, you know, husbandship is someone who manages his home. 
you know, frugally, like careful with for you know finances and 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 show and shows leadership and deals with problems. Wow, that's what it already means. Like so, I'm I'm not reinventing. I'm not inventing anything. This is just what it's meant all this time, and somehow it's been lost to this generation. For a lot of reasons, one is the way things men are portrayed on television. A lot of boys grow up without fathers, or their fathers work long hours. They go to school. Most of the teachers are women. Where is a young man, a, a boy, to learn what it means to be a man? Where are his male role models to be an example? Right? I mean, people learn more by what they see than what you tell them. And so, you know, I, I was once on a radio show, and a woman called in, and I said, she said, "Are you saying that a?" A woman can't teach a boy about being a man. I said, she could teach him, but she can't show him. And really, that's what really boys need, like to be able to watch a grown man, his fa- you know, usually it's his father, but there's no father, another grown man. The way a grown man acts, the way a grown man treats a woman, the way a grown man relates to other men. This is what's really been missing today. Wow, that's powerful. She can teach him, but she can't show him. That's That's deep. <laughs> Now let's talk about you know just the selling of foreign rights. So how do you how do you come across that decision? Like how did you decide to that you wanted to sell your book to different markets? Well, it started you know, first like like I said first you know I thought it was just for myself and my friends, and then like, it was really just for the North American market. But what what happened was uh you know there's a organization Independent Book Publishers Association, right? You've heard, you're familiar with them, right? I've heard of them, yes. IBPA. Uh-huh. Anyway, they, yeah, so they had, they had, uh, like, uh, you know, they have, a, for, like, Book Expo America, they have, like, uh, a cooperative booth. So you could pay a fee, and they would display the book at their booth at Book Expo America. And from that, I, I got inquiries from um, publishers in Mexico and Poland. And I thought, oh, I, yeah, I never thought of selling uh, foreign rights. So they wanted a copy of the book. So... I, I sent it to them. I just thought, well, okay, we'll see what happens. And they both wanted to publish it. So that sort of set me on the idea, well, maybe other, you know, publishers in other countries would. And and so I just started researching um, publishers. And, and more importantly, I, I researched foreign rights agents in different countries. So in, in different countries, there are agents who specialize in taking books published in one country and selling them to publishers in their own country, right? Selling the translation rights and the publishing rights. And, and you know, with today, with the internet and email, you don't have to go to, like, foreign rights fairs. You don't have to go to, you know, the big one is in Frankfurt, right? It's the Frankfurt Book Fair. You know, it's a lot of money to go to Frankfurt and be in a hotel and you have your book on a booth. But, I mean, and you could, there are cooperative booths that you could do this with, but you could just go on the internet and Google foreign rights agents. And what comes up is, a lot of what comes up is major publishers and major literary agents will give a list of their foreign rights agents that they deal with in each country. So if you're interested, if you're a publisher and want to publish one of their books in your country, you contact their foreign rights agent. But it includes their contact information. So I just prepared a email with, you know, describing the book and, you know, just pitching it and including a, a link to a, a television interview I did and including a review or two. And, you know, with email, you can include a, you know, a nice amount of information. And I emailed it to all these literary agents, like all over the world. Like it must have been, I don't know, 200 or so. But you know what? With email, it doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to mail on the book, nothing. And so the ones that wrote back and said they were interested in seeing the book, I sent it to them. And... And they were able to sell it to their publishers in their markets because they know the publishers in their country. That's their job. And they would know which ones would be the right fit, which publishers would be interested in that book. And and that's, and I was able to sell most of those 24 languages was mostly through that way. That is really cool. And it's a, it's a no cost solution to getting your book out. That's, that's very cool. And so, and so, with, with so, yeah, what, you know, it, so once you sell, once you sell the rights, um, like how, like how does that work? So, are you, are you, are you traditionally published or self-published? That one I published myself, the English one. Okay, so you I published sell, it myself. Yeah. Okay, and so, so you sell it to them, and then they, they publish it in 
the various lang languages? Do they translate it for you as well? Right. So that's that's the deal. It's they, you know, when you're selling rights, it's the, you're licensing them to translate it into their language and to publish it in their language in their market, right? It's uh, and 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 so now with, with the internet, everything is so much easier. Even you know, a lot of agents will just say send us a PDF. My policy is I don't like to send a PDF because I don't want to lose control of the book. I, I, but I mailed them copies of the book and that's really the only, only expense. It's, uh, it's, and, and, you know, the main thing is, is, is your book suitable for that market, right? Is it, is it the, is a kind of book that would be of interest, you know, novel or self-help book or a how-to book. I mean, you gotta, you gotta think about it. I mean, if it's a guide to, you know, downtown, you know, a city in the United States. Well, that might not be of interest to a publisher in the Czech Republic, but, but it, you have to think, is that the kind of book that would be of interest? Then uh, contact them. And also, I also contact some publishers directly. And, you know, this, and I was, you know, I think you just got to do research. You got to look, you know, each country has a, an association of book publishers and they'll have a list of the book publishers in their country. And you could look at their websites. And if you see a book, you know, if you see books that are kind of similar to your book, like that they've already translated, books like that were in English that are kind of similar in, in you know, the, the market that would be interested, the type of that, that type of book, then you could, okay, there's a good chance they'd be interested in your book and just email them. And everything is in English, right? Everybody communicates in English. English is the worldwide language. So it's, um, it, it really works. So let me just say there's three important benefits to selling uh, foreign rights. So one is revenue. You get more money. It's uh, and all the, the amount of money you get really depends on the country. A country that's wealthier, books are sold at a higher price. You would get more. A country that you know things are, you know, books are sold for less price. Maybe the economy is not as uh, wealthy as others. You would get less, but it's all revenue. <laughs> just take it right <laughs> and also <laughs> that's the first one the second one is it gets your message out so if your goal is if you want to get your message out and your goal is to change the entire world not just the world that w reads english or you just want to build an audience in the part of the world that doesn't read english this is the way to do it you can sell foreign language rights you're you're out there and it's you know i've gotten uh emails from people who read the book in different languages and you know they and or even on amazon right there's comments in in portuguese and spanish about the book so it's kind of nice nice to see uh i'm influencing my messages getting out to people all over the world because that's my goal to change the men of the world and and the third one which i you know is also important and maybe even the most important one is what you could say to the English language market, oh, my book has been translated in, in seven languages. Oh, that gets attention. That's it. Well, wow. That really gives it a lot of credibility. Right. So th there are th three very good reasons to translate your book into, into uh, to see if you can sell it into foreign languages. That's cool. Now, you had mentioned a little bit ago that, you know, when they ask for copies of the book in PDF, you don't want to give up control. Can you explain? Explain a little bit more about that because I have a question about that part. Well, because, you know, I mean, you should be able to trust them. And I do. I just have a policy like, you know, a PDF, you know, you could send that, you could share it to 10,000 people and, and then why would anybody buy your book? So, right. Okay. So my, that's my opinion. So I, I mean, some people do, and I actually, I've never heard anyone having a problem with that. It's just, I just say to them, I'm willing to send you as many copies of the book as you want. If you want, I'll even mail it directly to publishers that you want to submit it to, you know, to save you the postage. That's just my approach. That's what, that's what I believe. I just, uh, I, okay. I just, I just want to keep control. Right. Right. And so, and so when they get the hard copies, they just retype it themselves. Is that kind of the deal? When they get a hard copy, they, they translate it, right? It's, it's, yeah. uh, they get the hard copies they use and they give it to a translator and a translator works on the hard copy. It's, uh, okay. If they were working from PDF, they'd still, print, I assume would print it out and, and, and just write, uh, the translated yeah. version. I mean, uh, 
Oh, no, that makes sense. I was just was curious as to, you know, I didn't know if there was some, some reason where, why the PDF or uh, whether, why you uh, were going to keep the PDF as opposed to send the PDF. But now it makes, it makes perfect sense. It does make sense. Um, now, what are some things to watch out for? Like, you know, for, for the first timer who's trying to sell their rights to a foreign market who listens to this episode and says, wow, let me try that with my book. What are some things they should probably watch out for at the same time? Well, I think the like, main thing is, um, well, you know, just make sure you're dealing with reputable agents. I, I know, I know some, there are some agencies on the internet, and this is just my own bias, and I don't want to slander anybody, but I know that some, they, you know, they don't really give a, it's like a company, but they don't actually say who are the principals of the company. So I, those agents I have a problem with, but, and I don't, but those I don't see when you go to book publishers' pages listing their foreign rights agents, I haven't seen those. The main thing is, so let's say you get an offer. Okay, that's an excellent. What do you do when you get an offer from from a publisher? Yeah, we want to publish your book in Spanish. So generally, um, the royalty rate is usually around 7 or 8%, and it's less than 10% because they're paying for the translation, right? So they have to recover some of that cost. But at the same time, I would say, let's say they want to give you 7%, so I could say, okay, well, let's seven percent for the first printing. We'll make it eight percent for the second printing, and usually they agree to that. And the advance is usually the royalties for the first printing. So let's say they're going to sell your, and they'll tell they'll tell you the let's say the retail price. Let's say the retail price is ten dollars U.S. and they're going to give you eight percent royalty, and let's say they're going to print five thousand copies. So that's about four thousand dollars advance, right? It's a, it's eight. Uh, 80 uh, times 5,000 is, is, yeah, so it's $4,000, right? So, so that, that, and that, that situation. So just figure out what would be all the royalties for the first printing. And that's, that's a reasonable amount for, to ask for the advance. So that's, that's what I've usually asked for. And that's, that's a common uh, thing to, uh, another thing I often ask for, and sometimes they do, <laughs> is I ask to see the translation before they publish the book that and I usually find, I like to find a person who reads that language. I say, could you read this and tell me, you know, and here's the English book. Could you just make sure the translation is accurate? And, and, and sometimes they find mistakes, you know, uh, depending on how good the reader is. <laughs> so, <laughs> some, and so I just tell them, I can't say I demand these changes because I don't read the language. But I can say here, just, these are some points that the reader has pointed out, you know, just review them and make your and make the decision yourself. But just you know, you're just highlighting it. That's that's my approach. The other thing is to ask for uh, uh, to see the cover before they publish it. So I remember one country they published it. They were going to put the cover. I, I couldn't believe it. I, it was like a, it was like a, a Swiss Army knife with the blades open. I, <laughs> <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> What in the world? I like. What in the world are you thinking? Like, I couldn't understand it. So, I, so they they changed it. They changed it to like um, an old uh, time, uh, old pocket watch, as if like to indicate wisdom. They never really explained to me why they're gonna have that knife. Like, like this, it's like you, this is like how to like stab your wife. Like, what is? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So, but these are things I asked for. And it's good to review them it's to see the cover to make sure you're okay with it. And and I don't, I don't see. I guess my approach is. Uh, I, I trust that they know their market. But, uh, so I don't say I have to approve it. I just say I would like to give my input on it. That, that's just my approach because uh, I, I trust that they know their market and what would sell there. So th that's another thing I do. I ask to see the uh, the, the cover. Uh, another thing you should be aware of is some countries they have withholding tax, which is, um, they, you know, uh, the, there's, and you have to look at there's treaties on the, avoiding double taxation. So, if if you show that you are a taxpayer in your own country, they 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 reduce the withholding tax to a smaller amount or to or to or to zero, and then you're able to claim it on your income tax. I'm not a tax person, so I can't explain it. But that's um, but that's common withholding tax in a lot of countries. Um, and really, you know, just. Um, that, that's that's the main thing. Just keep keep. Oh, you know what? Another thing is um, when you uh, let let's say you you have like ten agents working for you, starting to sell your book, and, and one agent sells the book, 
So keep the other agents updated on what's happening, the progress of your book. Just keep sending them stuff like, oh, I just made a sale in, in Mexico. You know, let, you, let the publishers know who are considering the book. Let them know. If you get a review, send it to them. If you do a TV interview or radio, send them the link so they could share it. Just keep updating them. You're helping them, you know, sell your book. So it's, it's a good thing to do. Well, those are all great tips. Those are all really good tips for people who are looking to, to start that. That's, that. that's exciting, though, just being able to have the opportunity to sell your book around the globe. Yeah, I know it's nice. It, it's exciting. And, you know, I, I guess with my book, my book was really aimed at sharing what I learned with other men. And, and so to really make a difference because, you know, there's a lot of divorce, a lot of children from broken homes. And you could say, and a lot of them are, initiated by the woman, right? In the United States, it's like 70% of divorces are initiated by the woman. And a lot of them are frustrated with men because they don't act like men. It's like, this is an issue that it's so interesting that hardly anybody talks about, but underlying so much of women's frustration with men and why they want to divorce them is because they're, they're not acting like, like they expect a man to act. So if I'm able to make a difference in these different countries, say people not getting divorced, families staying together because you know, the father has read this and says, oh, I realize I got to start being the leader and start acting like a father and a husband. Then that, that's very rewarding. It's, it's meaningful. It's making a difference in the world. It's very, it's like, you know, gives life meaning, meaning and purpose. Yeah, yeah. No. So how, how many copies have you sold globally? Do you know off the top of your head? Around 100,000. Huh? Oh, I missed that part. What was that? But a hundred thousand. Oh, a hundred thousand. Okay. Wow, that's good. That's really good. Yeah. You yeah. Are... I just think if, if every, if I if if I was able to save some families, save some marriages, then that's very rewarding. Oh yeah. I mean, if you have a hundred thousand people read it and take action, that's that's a big impact. That's a big. Even ten percent of that's still a very good impact. You know. So. Very yeah, good. Yeah. Very good. All right, so we're gonna kind of cover to come in for a landing here. I'm just gonna ask you just a, just some fun questions to wrap up to round out the interview, and then uh, we'll be all set. So, okay. who, are some, who are some who are some writers and authors uh, who inspire you? Well, you know what, a book that I read that inspired me a lot was um, it's called uh, "How to Argue and Win Every Time." <laughs> you ever heard of it by Jerry Spence? No, I haven't. You, you know, so Jerry Spence is a famous lawyer in the United States. He defended Imelda Marcos. He represented the Silkwood family. And he talks about his life. And like this trans, he was a lawyer. He kept losing cases. And then he came to the point of asking himself, why do I lose? He says, why do I let other, who gives the other side permission to beat me? I, he says, I do. <laughs> So he's going to stop. And it really made me realize it's, it's you know, we can change ourselves. And, and I mean, he, he became a really a top-notch lawyer and, and, and very persuasive. Very, and he says, you know, it's really, you know, it's the same thing with my book. I mean, you know, you think, oh, I'm, I, I can't. I'm in this situation with my wife. Like, I'm, you know, she just rules over me and I just do whatever she says and I can't change. I said, yes, you can. You can change your situation. You can decide this is going on because I'm letting it go on and you can change yourself and step forward and be a man. So that his, his book inspired me a lot. It's, uh, okay, cool. Um, so when you're not writing, you know, what do you enjoy doing? Oh, I enjoy like outdoor things like uh, hiking and bicycling and uh, in the winter cross country skiing cuz I'm in Canada and there's a lot of snow here. <laughs> <laughs> That's I like to, you know, I like to keep uh, you know, keep my body going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard about the the short summers of Canada. My friends, I my Canadian friends joke about that quite a bit. The two week summers they call them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so, you know, prior, prior to becoming an author, what was your, what was your first life? Well, <clears throat> I, I, I retired from my job. I used to work in the government here as a speech writer. I, I, I was always been into writing. So I, I wrote speeches for politicians. That was fun. And uh, that was the main thing I did. I did some policy work on, on other stuff, but, uh, 
that's what I did. And so I retired and I'm really trying to, you know, get the ideas out there. Like that men have to uh, change and we have to start acting like, you know, like men who are, are strong and show leadership and, uh, and, and the kind of man that a woman really wants, but men don't realize it. Right. Yeah. That's very cool speech writing. Interesting. So, so what's next for you? Um, I just want to continue. I really want to get the message out more. I think, you know, every, everywhere I, 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 you know, it's a fascinating thing is when I talk to women, women are more aware of this issue than men. Like they talk about ma- the masculinity crisis. They talk about the feminization of men. They talk about men confused. I mean, all kinds of women who are, let's say, 40s, 50s, and they say, I can't find a decent man. I, I want a man who's a, who's a rock. I don't want a man who's so, you know, weak and always just, you know, can stand up and, and show leadership. So, so for men, I, 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 men don't seem all that aware. They think they're, they're, they're doing, that's the whole thing. All the messages they hear, oh, I'm doing what, you know, I'm being this nice guy. I'm not controlling. I'll let her make the decisions. So I'll show I'm not controlling. They don't realize this isn't, this isn't helping. It's, it's, it's all, so women are, are very much aware of the need for for men to to learn these things that men, men used to learn, so I, I really want to go forward with it. And I think I think you know it's very rewarding to make a difference. It's very rewarding, you know, if a family can stay together. You know, when they have children, that children shouldn't be from a broken home. Right. I think you know it, you know what it. I mean, that's a it's a big thing. When a child from loses a father in a divorce, it's tragic. Especially daughters. You know, daughters they look to their fathers to be a role model of what a man should be. And so many daughters lose their fathers. It's so tragic. Yeah, no, it definitely is. It's funny. I'm a. <clears throat> I came out of a health writing background for the last few years, and this is it's the same thing in health writing too, where all of the all the articles and all the content, everything we ever written, everything we wrote that was targeted towards men, had to be written so that there was really so that their wives would get it to them, because men don't because men <laughs> just don't take their, they don't take their health seriously. Like I mean. I went to some health conferences and they just talked about how do we reach men? How do we reach men? They're not, they're not taking care of their health. They're not reading anything. They don't want to go to the doctor. And so that's, it's, men are a tough nut to crack. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Except what you're saying is true, except when they're in crisis, right? So yes. they have a serious health crisis and then they pay attention. So it's yes. the same thing in a marriage or in a relationship, you get kicked in the head you know, and then you suddenly realize, hey, you know, I, I got to learn something. You know, they, you know, when you're in pain as a motivator, right? You're, you're in pain. You say, I got to find the answer because I got to get out of pain. And that's, yes, it is. And that's, <laughs> All right. So, that's, Elliot, yeah. uh, Elliot tell, tell our audience how they can, uh, how they can reach you beyond the, beyond the episode here. Okay. So, my website is www.elliotcats.com. It's E-L-L-I-O-T-T, double T. K A T Z dot com and you can email me through there or if you want to pick up my book and tell me read and tell me what you're thinking about it. It's it's on Amazon as a paperback and as an ebook and it's also an ebook on Kobo and iBooks. And it's also in bookstores, the paperbacks in bookstores, and if you go there and they're sold out, just ask them to order it, they'll get it to you pretty quickly. And I welcome hearing from people. You know, it's very rewarding to hear the comments people make. And if you have any questions or thoughts about what you know, what we talked about today, or if you get a chance to read the book, you want to tell me what you think, I, I welcome hearing it. Awesome. Thank you, Elliot, so much. And uh, the title of the book is, oh, I, gotta, I just had it. Oh. Yeah, the title is, I forgot what the <laughs> title. Is. The title is Being the Strong Man a Woman Wants, Timeless Wisdom on Being a Man. So it's Being the Strong Man a Woman Wants, Timeless Wisdom on Being a Man. All right. So thank you so much for joining me today, Elliot. Okay. It's great to be here.